Um, so I'll introduce our first speaker, who is Callan Arnold, a um, PhD student from here at the University of Leeds. Perfect. Um, so, like Wendy said, and for those of you who don't know me, my name is Helen Arnold, and I'm a PhD student based um, upstairs in Lida um, with the School of Medicine. And I was asked to give kind of a brief talk introducing some of kind of the basic principles of causal inference and statistics. And I attended the last local um, RSS seminar series on machine learning, and I found it to be really interesting and thought-provoking. But I noticed a lot of the talks were really heavily focused on machine learning for prediction rather than causal inference. So just to kind of introduce some of the key concepts of causal inference, um, and specifically how it differs from more standard um, prediction modeling, I thought it would be useful, useful to consider the context of causal inference in linear modeling and then kind of explore some of the lessons we might take forward as machine learning methods become more prominent and widely used in health research. So there do seem to be kind of a growing number of people who are starting to raise some just red flags and maybe concerns about the use of machine learning and by extension artificial intelligence in health research. For example, there's quite a lot of discussion about kind of the ethics and biases of machine learning algorithms and the implicit biases that might be programmed into them. Um, for example, you might have heard about an, an algorithm that was developed by Amazon recently that ended up being biased against women. Or the bot that was developed by Microsoft, which was turned into a, quote, genocidal maniac <laughs> after spending just 24 hours on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, surprising. And if you've not read the book, um, Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill, I highly recommend it. And she discusses how big data combined with the increasing use of algorithms in modern society is contributing to inequality and threatening democracy. Um, there's also been a bit of discussion and debate about um, the degree to which machine learning methods really offer an improvement over more standard statistical methods. Um, for example, a systematic review that was published just a few months ago found that machine learning methods for clinical prediction were no better than simple logistic regression models. Um, but the main topic of my talk today is about the conflation of prediction and causation. And this issue has been recognized elsewhere and across lots of different contexts. Um, but I don't think the issue or its implications are really recognized widely enough in current applications in health research. And this has important implications for the subsequent adoption of machine learning methods going forward. So epidemiology, which is the field that some of us work in upstairs in Lida, already doesn't really have the greatest reputation for causal inference. And this can be attributed to lots of different things. Um, for example, you might encounter measurement error and data quality issues. Um, there's lots of pressure to, um, um, to publish and lots of publication biases that might exist as well. And also just kind of the media's general lack of nuance in the way that they report on scientific studies. But another fundamental issue, I think, is that a lot of health research conflates prediction and causation, either explicitly or implicitly. For example, this headline in The Guardian that was just published last week um, stated that the risk of obesity can be accurately predicted in babies, which was then immediately followed by the headline, uh, factors including birth weight could determine the likelihood of childhood obesity thereby attributing an implicit causal significance to a particular predictive factor. And in case you think this is just an issue with how um, results are presented in the media, here's an example that received a bit of publicity when it was published um, from a peer-reviewed uh, medical journal, where the authors studied the association between active commuting and various health-related outcomes, and then implicitly endowed that association with a causal meaning by suggesting that encouraging active commuting could reduce the risk of those health outcomes. And I could point to a lot of different examples of this, but it's really not my intention to kind of single out any particular studies or individuals. My intention is really just to highlight the problem, as well as some of the potential solutions that might be found in modern causal inference methods, 
which I think has applicability to the adoption of machine learning methods going forward. So just to identify several key reasons why prediction and causation might be conflated, I think the first is that both prediction and causal modeling can utilize the same modeling frameworks. So for example, generalized linear models, which is what I'll talk about in this talk, can be used for both prediction and causal inference, which might kind of blur the distinction between them. I think a lot of ambiguity is also created by the language of risk factors, which is such a common term, especially in health research, but means a lot of different things in different contexts, and often conflates correlational relationships with causal ones. And finally, I think for a long time throughout the history of statistics, causality was really considered to be a taboo topic, which caused a lot of people to kind of dance around the issue of causality. And it also resulted in a lack of training in statistical methods for causal inference. So whereas, for instance, almost everyone knows how to run a standard linear model on their computer, a lot fewer, comparatively speaking, are as familiar with the formal theoretical framework that allows us to make causal inference using those models. So because this talk is partly meant to serve as a basic introduction to causal inference, I'm going to start off with just a base in basic introduction to causal graphs. And the causal graphs we typically use take the form of directed acyclic graphs, or DAGs. And DAGs are non-parametric causal models, which consist of nodes, which represent variables, that are connected by directed edges, or direct causal effects. So for example, the DAG on the right there implies that A causes B. And in technical terms, what we mean is that A is a part of the function that is used to assign a value to B. But in kind of more layman's terms, what it means is that changing the value of A somehow causes a change in the value of B. So the arc transmits a causal statistical association between the two variables, and this is what we mean by a causal effect. So the only prohibition in the DAG is that no variable can cause itself. So you can't have this scenario on the right where you have A causing B causing C, which in turn causes A again, because this would create a cycle and DAGs are, by definition, acyclic. And a DAG represents the hypothesized data generating process. And what I mean by that is it's the process by which different variables obtain their values. And DAGs can be as simple or as complex as you'd like, but they're all made up of three basic causal structures. The first one is called a chain, and this is where A causes B and B causes C or in other words, A causes C indirectly via B. The second one is a fork, which is where B causes both A and C. And the third one is a collider, which is where A and C both independently cause B. So you can view a DAG as a map of statistical dependencies, since each one of the three causal structures implies certain statistical dependencies and independencies. So whereas traditional statistics focuses only on associations, DAGs focus on the different causal structures that give rise to those associations. So the chain structure, in which A causes C indirectly by B, implies that A and, D, A and C are statistically dependent. Um, there are certain cases, called intransitive cases, where this doesn't hold, but in general A and C are dependent in this structure. However, A and B are independent when you condition on B, and we use boxes to indicate conditioning for a variable. So because A transmits an association to C via B, if we can condition on B, we block that transmission. For example, if we're looking at heart attack survival, we might encounter this chain structure, where the proximi your proximity to the hospital affects your time to treatment, which in turn affects your survival. So in this scenario, we'd expect your proximity to the hospital to be associated with your risk of survival. But if we were to condition on time to treatment, for example, if we looked only at individuals who received treatment within, say, 10 minutes, there would likely be no association between your proximity to the hospital and your survival. The fork structure, in which B causes both A and C, implies that A and C are dependent, but become independent when we condition on B. 
For example, if we consider the relationship between the number of gray hairs and your risk of Alzheimer's, we'd expect to see a positive association between them, despite no causal, direct causal connection, because both of them increase with age. However, if we were to condition on age, for instance, if we looked only at 65-year-olds, we'd find no association between number of gray hairs and your risk of Alzheimer's. And this is the causal structure we mean when we typically talk about confounding. We mean that at least part of an association between two variables is spurious or non-causal in nature, and in order to remove that spurious component, we have to condition on their common cause. And the collider structure, in which A and C both independently cause B, is probably the most counterintuitive in terms of the implied dependencies. This structure implies that A and C are independent, but become dependent when you condition on their common result, B. <laughs> so to illustrate why this is with kind of a silly example, um, I stole this from Peter, by the way. Um, if you imagine that there are two main factors that determine how attractive your partner is, one might be your own level of attractiveness, and the other one is how much money you have or your wealth. These two things are independent. Your level of attractiveness and wealth are independent. So if you were to meet someone for the first time and they weren't very attractive, that wouldn't really change your probability of them being wealthy. But if you then learn that they have a really attractive partner, the probability of them being wealthy now goes up. This is what Peter also refers to as the Donald Trump phenomenon. <laughs> so, whereas two independent events become dependent when you condition on their common result. So why have I told you all this? Well, first of all, I've done it to introduce causal graphs, but more specifically, I've done it to illustrate how two variables can be associated without being causally related, and thus draw more formal distinction between what is a quote-unquote predictor and a cause. So in each of these causal structures here, you might consider A to be a predictor of C, but in only one of them is A actually a cause of C. And not only that, but in the third case, in the case of a collider structure, A only predicts C conditional on another variable, B. So with that in mind, I'll move on to a more formal definition of the distinction between prediction and causation, or the target of causal modeling, which is causal inference. So prediction is concerned with estimating the likely value, or often the risk of an outcome, given information from one or more observed factors. For example, estimating the expected risk of preterm birth for a mother who smokes during pregnancy. In contrast, causal inference is concerned with estimating the likely change in the value of an outcome that is due to a potentially hypothetical change in a particular factor. For example, the degree to which maternal smoking during pregnancy increases the risk of preterm birth. So prediction in this context is essentially a classification task. It's about identifying mothers who are at risk of preterm birth, whereas causal inference is an estimation task, which estimates how the risk of preterm birth would change if we were able to change maternal smoking. So causal explanation is sometimes referred to as counterfactual prediction, since it's about estimating how the outcome would be different if something else were different. And this is an often important task in treatment decisions, particularly in healthcare. And the distinction between these two objectives has important analytical consequences, um, which all demonstrate in the framework of generalized linear models, um, since these are probably, arguably, the most familiar and standard method of analysis for data scientists and health researchers. But I think the issues are also relevant to machine learning methods. So if we think about what a GLM does, hopefully this is recap for everyone, but it expresses a function of the expected value of a single variant, which I've called Y here, as a linear combination of a set of observed covariates, which are independent or explanatory variables, or simply predictors. So GLMs can be used for both prediction and causal inference, but the focus of each is very different. So if we go back to those original definitions of prediction and causal inference, 
We can see that in the context of a GLM, prediction is concerned with obtaining the best estimate of the outcome, or E of Y, whereas causal inference is concerned with es obtaining the best estimate of a particular beta coefficient, for example, beta 1, which represents the causal effect of x1 on y. So given this, it's probably not surprising that models for prediction require different methods for model building and testing than models for causal inference, despite the fact that they both are GLMs. It should also probably be unsurprising that methods which optimize prediction of an outcome don't necessarily optimize estimation of an unbiased causal effect. So if we consider GLMs for prediction, which are inherently outcome focused, we can see that the standard model building and evaluation process is also very outcome focused. The aim of the GLM for prediction is really just to obtain the quote unquote best estimate of the outcome. And I've put it in quotes because we often have to balance predictive power with parsimony so that the model is generalizable to a different data set. But essentially in order to obtain the best estimate of E of Y, we generally tend to first identify potential covariates to include as predictors. And these are usually variables that are hypothesized to be strongly associated with the outcome, though not necessarily directly causally related to it. And we might also identify various variables which are easy to measure or record. We then narrow them down in some way, for example, best subsets or stepwise procedures, and ultimately select a subset which are considered optimal based on one or more statistical criteria. We can then evaluate how accurate this model performs using some global measures of fit. And what I mean by global measures of fit is that they're measures which evaluate how well the model performs overall and which don't focus that much on the specific choice of model covariates. So for example, if we consider this little schema here on the right, we start with five potential covariates, x1 to x5, and narrow them down by some process to x1, x2, and x4. And we can briefly consider what this resulting model tells us. So the model tells us the expected value of the outcome y given data on our model covariates x1, x2, and x4. And we can measure how accurate this estimate is, but this is essentially what our model selection process has told us is optimal. But beyond that, we can't really say much else. In terms of the model covariates themselves, all we can really say is that these are the three covariates which provide the most efficient trade-off between predictive accuracy and parsimony. And these covariates should really only be judged as a group. They don't have any sensible interpretation in isolation because the inclusion of each one of them is conditional on the inclusion of all others. However, as we've seen before, it's common for people to then attribute implicit causal significance or even predictive significance to the individual covariates, even though the model building process wasn't optimized for them. In terms of what the individual parameter or coefficient values mean, all that can really be said is that they represent conditional associations between the variables and the outcome. So for instance, beta 1 might represent a conditional association between x1 and y, and it's conditional because we've conditioned on x2 and x4 by including them in the model as well. However, if we go and look at what that actually means in the causal framework, it might not actually mean that much. So, a GLM is itself agnostic to the causal structure of the data to which it's fit, and the prediction modeling process doesn't tend to make any assumptions about causality. So if we imagine that these are the true causal relationships amongst Y and the five different covariates we considered, and we're trying to make sense of what this beta 1 coefficient here means, we can use this graph to see that the coefficient beta 1 or the conditional association between x1 and y is comprised of several different components. Firstly, it's comprised of the direct causal association between x1 and y, which is highlighted in green. It also includes a spurious association that's due to the common cause x5, which we haven't conditioned on because we've not included it in our model, and that's highlighted in red. <coughs> 
It also, it's also comprised of a spurious association that's due, of, due to conditioning on the collider X2, which creates a dependency between X1 and X3 and transmits a spurious, another spurious association to Y. And finally, there might even be another variable out here, which I just called X6, that's causing both X1 and Y, but we've not even considered it to be included in our model because we didn't have it in the data set we wanted or we didn't think that its association with Y was strong enough to warrant considering in the first place. But nevertheless, this other variable out here is creating another dependency between X1 and Y. So all of these different associations are wrapped up into that single beta coefficient. So really, trying to interpret this co coefficient, or any of the others in the model for that matter, um, is pretty futile. Any coefficient in a GLM could potentially represent any combination of a true causal association, either direct or direct and indirect, or some combination thereof. A spurious association that's due to uncontrolled or unmeasured confounding. Or a spurious association that's due to uncontrolled collider bias. And there are also two other things that I haven't even touched on here, but which are also important. It could also represent reverse causation or simply randomness. But the point is that in the absence of any formal framework, there's really no way to sensibly attribute or assess the relative contribution of each one of these to any particular beta coefficient in your model. So it's really difficult to interpret them. So if we want to quantify the magnitude of an association between a particular covariate and the outcome in any sort of meaningful way, we need a completely different paradigm for model building. So GLMs for causal inference, instead, aim to estimate the causal effect of an outcome on changing a particular factor, or the causal association between a particular factor and the outcome. So in order to do that, we need to identify all of the potential causal pathways through which those changes are realized, as well as the potential non-causal pathways that in some way distort our estimate of that effect. So, in, so to identify possible covariates that create or transmit spurious associations is what we first have to do. And then we have to identify a subset to condition on which satisfy these three conditions that they eliminate all of the spurious associations, they don't eliminate any of the causal association, and they don't create any additional spurious associations when we condition on them. And then we can evaluate this model using local independence testing, which I think Johannes will be discussing a bit in his talk. Um, or for example, we can conduct some sort of sensitivity analyses <coughs> to evaluate the robustness of our estimate to unmeasured or uncontrolled confounding bias. So for example, if we want to estimate the causal effect of a variable x1 on y, we first need to create a map of all the variables we think are potentially relevant, and not just the variables we have in a specific data set, and then identify a suitable set of them to condition on, which will leave all of the green causal pathways intact, eliminate bias due to confounding, which in this case would be x3, x5, and x6, and also not create any additional collider bias. So this is a process where we put our assumptions out front. It requires us to specify how we assume associations between variables arise, and then build a model based on those assumptions. So what it means in this case is that we condition on x3, x5, and x6, which in the context of a GLM means including them as covariates in your model. And we can then interpret beta 1 as an estimate of the total causal effect of x1 on y, or the conditional association between x1 and y that's due only to the causal effect. So, what implications does this have for machine learning methods? Or what lessons can we take forward with us as we be begin to kind of embrace these methods in health research? First of all, I think it's important to recognize that modeling processes that are optimized for prediction are not necessarily optimized for causal inference. And conflating them in an area like health research can have really serious consequences. Machine learning methods 
and in particular the ones that share a lot of similarities with more standard regression modeling, are likely to suffer a lot of the same issues with conflating prediction and causation if we're not careful. Notably, a lot of the current promise of machine learning is based on prediction, and prediction tends to prioritize undirected associations over directed associations, and data-driven over theory-driven model selection. And this isn't to suggest that prediction modeling doesn't have its uses as well, because it does, but it needs to be clearly distinguished from causal inference. And pred prediction methods aren't necessarily suited to causal analyses or causal inference right out of the box. So my third point is just that attributing causal effects requires some sort of causal assumptions. In order to attribute causal effects, we need to understand data generation mechanisms and then somehow incorporate knowledge of causal mechanisms or potential causal mechanisms into our model building process. Unfortunately, I was able to find some evidence um, with just a quick Google search to suggest that machine learning methods for prediction are already starting to be misused and misinterpreted in some of the same ways as generalized linear models for prediction are. Now again, I don't want to kind of single out any particular studies or name and shame anyone. That's definitely not my, um, my goal here, but just to make you aware that this is starting to happen already um, and maybe offer some recommendations going forward. So with that in mind, I just want to um, close my talk with a couple of recommendations or lessons I think we can learn from the application or potentially the misapplication of generalized linear models. The first is that the purpose of any model really should be specified from the outset, and then that model should be built, tested, and interpreted with appropriate respect for that context. And hopefully that will ensure that some of these methods create clarity rather than confusion in terms of what is published in the literature. And the second is that modern causal inference methods um, should be integrated with machine learning approaches to harness the full power of these methods. And in fact, there already is um, work that's starting to be done in this area. Here are just a few examples within economics where work is being done on machine learning methods for causal inference. So just to finish up, I'd like to acknowledge several of my mentors and collaborators here um, that have provided input into the material for this talk. And just thank you for listening. Okay, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is Peter Tennant, a university academic fellow from here at the University of Leeds. Okay, so I'm going to talk about something a little bit different um, to what a lot of people would think of as causal inference. Uh, but actually, the context is a wonderful example, again, of the problems with conflating a good predictor with a good um, causal effect or, or a variable that is a good cause of something else. So this is to consider the problem of analysis of change. And where I come at We've just seen Callum talk about, in a sense, a lot of the, the traditional language and thinking and theory that differentiates between prediction and causal inference. Um, but one of the other areas that is of particular interest to me is how it can help you as an individual to think. And so what we like to talk about in terms of the wider benefits of causal inference is not just those top two more obvious ones that they help with identifying and considering potential sources of confounding, yes. That they help with identifying and considering potential sources of collider bias. Blimey, if you didn't know what that was, it's going to be very hard to understand without causal inference methods. They hugely help with that. What else do they help with? Well, we've just touched on that. They help with identifying your own assumptions about the data generating process and exhibiting those and making them public. So we move from a system where a traditional epidemiologist like myself would have conversations in the back room where you go, I'm not really sure, these, I think these are the, the main confounders, I'm not sure, what do you think? No, I think that might be on the causal pathway. 
We choose our selection in the dark. It's not really very well explained. Now we produce a DAG. We show that DAG and everybody knows the assumptions that we've made. Hugely important. And so in a sense, it is encouraging us to move to a more transparent way of researching. But it also, as part of that process, I think, encourage us to be more thoughtful. And one of the ways that I really like that it does this is that causal inference as a philosophy and formerly causal inference methods demand that we separate identifying what it is we want to know from estimating. Now again, a traditional epidemiologist like myself would often be told, go and play with the data. And so what I would actually do is I'd go and have a look at all the different variables and I'd start to play around and I'd see what's going on, what do I think of the, the confounders, etc. You know, and start to build up a model based on interacting very much actively with the data set. But instead, suddenly this paradigm has said, no, you must stop, you must tell me, what do you want to know first before you go away and you, you then build your model? What is your estimand. Okay? So this, actually coming up with this and realizing this is often not what we have typically done. And this is where analysis of change really comes to life. Because we often just do what everyone else has done because that's what everyone else has done. And nobody turned around and said yes, but is that the estimand you really wanted? Cause and inference says, no, what is your estimate? What is the true difference in Y, for example, that you seek? Based on that, using what we've just learned from Kellen, we build our estimator, whatever method we use. Again, a traditional epidemiologist like myself, it'll be a regression model. But I will build the regression model to attempt to seek the best estimate of my estimate. And then I'll be very impressed and very proud. But we have separated those processes, and that is absolutely critical. Because when you combine that with causal diagrams, you realize you've got this new belief that you absolutely must think a lot more about what it is you want to know, and this new language that can help you really understand what's going on. This is crucial for understanding observational data in general, not just for working out confounders, because Observational data and experimental data, the machine learning algorithm will see them as the same. They're not. Observational data comes with a very long and rich backstory. And we need to know about that backstory in order to know about how to conduct our analysis. And if we don't, once we move away from randomized controlled trials, then of course we know we're susceptible to confounding bias. We're susceptible to collider bias. We're susceptible to conditioning on the app. We're susceptible to regression to the mean. We're susceptible to mathematical coupling bias and composite variable bias. Things we may not even know exist. But things that we need to know exist and we need to understand because there are real challenges. There are real dragons out there waiting for us. And when you ask the question, about the economic harm of getting these things wrong. Well, I work in health. I'm not bothered about the economic harm. I'm bothered about people dying because we've thrown everything into a machine learning algorithm, misinterpreted it, and then either, in the best case scenario, done things that were less ideal than something else, or in the worst case scenario, literally interpreted the opposite of the truth. So these, we need to know about these things. And when we're looking at change, which generally is probably the most important thing that we're of interest in, and it's all very well looking at a fixed variable, in general, in most of what we do, we're interested in how can we change things, these things become critical. And they are very nicely exemplified by the world's simplest example change scores, or analyzing change between two time points. So, hopefully everyone in this room will know this. 
a change score, a difference score, a difference from baseline score. There's a number of different words that are used for them, but what are they? They are composite variables that we as analysts might naively construct from two measures of a single parent, typically something like a follow-up and a baseline. And what we do is we subtract um, the baseline from the follow-up and we create this new variable. And why do we do that? I'm not always entirely sure. It's because we've all done it, I guess. Or because many people have done it in the past. And maybe it's some idea that we need to standardize out the part that wasn't determined at baseline. You know, if everyone has different baseline levels, we want to try and get rid of that because we're not doing a trial. So we'll just, we'll create this, we'll subtract that away, and we'll have some kind of standardized measure we can look at. Oh no, it doesn't do that at all. I'm afraid not. And there are so many problems that you've, we've all just naively created without thinking what we've really done. The first of which is this, mathematical coupling bias. And that is that we forget that sometimes by creating a variable, it will now have a direct association with any of the parts we have just created it from is so simply obvious. Clearly, if x, if we create y1 minus y0, it is going to have a tautological association with y0, because it includes y0. Mathematically, algebraically. If you like your regression model, you can look on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. You can see y0 is there, y0 is there. You will expect a correlation, a very, very large one, 1 over root 2, I think it's around 0 0.81, 0.71. <laughs> I was writing this after midnight last night, so I couldn't be bothered looking it up. <laughs> it's large. It's huge. That's not a problem. It's statistically unbiased. It's a problem when we don't realize that tautology. And we then infer meaning to the relationship. So if we have built an uh, assumption-free model, and we're trying to predict change, we've got baseline in there, and it says, wow, this is a really good predictor. Of course it is. It's absolutely tautological. And indeed, the habit of attributing this mathematical certainty as meaningful goes back a very long way. Does anyone know of the law of initial value? You know, where you start from, generally, determines where you're going to go. In particular, if you have a particularly large extreme value, you know, you're going to end up going down. People also talk about this as floor and ceiling effects. They also call it regression to the mean. Most of the time, that is not regression to the mean. That is a very different phenomenon. It is simply mathematical coupling because y0 is going to have a very large negative correlation with the minus y0 in the chain score. Kenan said she didn't want to draw on any particular examples. I want to highlight this idiot, um, 2010, um, who did an analysis of change um, of long function between ages 14 and 50 and found an association that didn't seem to make sense. And in the conclusion says, two results are striking for their magnitude and or direction. We can ignore the first one, the relative decline in women compared to men. But then the other one, the negative association between lung function at age 14 and change thereafter. Although both may represent regression to the mean, nope, that was the reviewer who told me that. Other explanations are plausible. Yes, I now know the other explanation. Alas, instead, I think I spend a paragraph describing the mechanistic explanation for a complete statistical artifact. But what happens when we move away from that nice scenario where we can see the mathematical coupling on each side of the equation and now we have a situation where we have a change score but we're relating it to some other variable. There is no longer tautology. Is there still a problem? Mm. We need to know because 
This is still very common. And actually, the majority of analyses of change still involve this sort of scenario. Okay, so they're seeking to understand the effect of some baseline exposure on change in some outcome. Well, in randomized controlled trials, most people will know the answer if you're used to randomized controlled trials. You don't analyze different scores or change scores because, although they provide the same answers on average to other methods such as follow-up adjusting for baseline or ANCOVA, they have lower power. Okay? And this is a fact that's widely known within the trials community. We don't analyze change scores, we do ANCOVA because the power is inferior. Fine. Good. What about observational data? <coughs> there suddenly it all falls apart. Because one thing happens immediately. They give completely different answers. Which one is right? And that analyzing the change score, or doing this follow-up adjusting for baseline analysis, or ANCOVA sort of analysis. Which one is right? We'll look at the literature. Well, this chap says, in non-randomized trials, observational data, an over of change, so analyzing the change score, seems less biased than ANCOVA. So they're saying there's problems with ANCOVA, there's problems with doing follow-up adjusting for baseline, so we should analyze the change score instead. And they're not alone. Glymore et al., very, very big paper, huge, huge influential paper in epidemiology. In some cases, change score analysis without baseline adjustment provide unbiased estimates when baseline adjusted estimates are biased. In other words, you should use the change score and not be adjusting for the baseline. But then you look elsewhere and they say the opposite. This is Stephen Sand. Although many situations can be envisaged where ANCOVA is biased, it is very difficult to imagine circumstances under which change score analysis would then be unbiased. My favorite one, Modeling the change between two time points is justified only in a few situations. And you realize that this very argument has been described a long time ago. 1967, Frederick Lord actually proposed a situation that has been come to be known as Lord's Paradox. Okay? And beautifully enough, he ends up invoking that exact same argument. Because it describes a scenario and then uses these wonderful ellipses which make absolutely no sense to anybody. He says, a large university is interested in investigating the effect of the diet provided and any sex differences. Let's ignore the diet, they're just saying he's interested in sex and the outcome, the weight of each student at the time of his arrival and the following June are recorded. So what's the relationship between sex and change in weight? And then he describes two statisticians, two imaginary statisticians who provide advice. One who does a change score analysis and says there's no effect. They do it by sex, so they look in girls and they say the average um, weight at the start and the end of the year in girls was the same. In boys, the average weight at the start and the end of the year was the same. Nothing's going on. The other statistician does an ANCOVA essentially, follow up adjusted for baseline, and concludes, actually, the change was greater in boys than girls. And I have stared at these ellipses to try and understand <laughs> what is going on there. And I can't work it out. I even once produced a video that apparently demonstrated it. But now I look at that and have no idea what I was on about. But the point is, invoking what is still going on, if the dietitian had only one statistician, she would reach very different conclusions, depending on which one they had. Which is all very reassuring. It's not like there's lots of money and lots of lives on the line in the work that we do. And it's not like we're talking about one of the simplest data analytic tasks. Change between two time points. Never mind the machine learning fancies. Hang on, if we can't get this right, why are we playing with those fancy toys? <coughs> well, we can get it right very quickly if we just go back to that first step. Hang on. What did we want to know? What is our estimate? 
in general, the total causal effect of some exposure on some outcome. So we know some summary measure of if we change the exposure, what would happen to the outcome? The fact the outcome is some point in future or not doesn't matter. In terms of our estimate, that's what we want, usually. That will certainly provide that useful summary. How do we work that out? We go back to the advice that Kevin's just given. We follow the standard rules of DAGs, and suddenly it's all incredibly obvious. If we have a situation like this, we say y0, the baseline outcome, is a competing exposure. Here's the thing we want to know. This arc, how does our exposure cause our outcome? This is a competing exposure, as in it's irrelevant. We don't actually really have to do anything with it. We could adjust for it, and there are improvements to precision that you would gain by doing so. But this is the randomized control trial scenario where this is essentially irrelevant. Then we get to the confounding scenario, the one maybe we're more familiar with. Actually, the baseline outcome caused the exposure, and together they caused the follow-up outcome. Well, what's the estimate in that situation? It's dead easy. It's a confounder. Backdoor path, we need to condition on this. To close that, we would add y0 to the regression model, and we'd have y1, the follow-up measure, as the outcome. Where's the change score coming into this? Let's have a look at the other scenario. There are lots. We can make them more complicated. We can add all kinds of other variables. But ultimately, they all summarize to these three scenarios. The third one, I shouldn't say WC, I should say X0, is causing the outcome both at, the, um, both at baseline and follow-up. How does that make sense? How can we have a situation where, if they're measured at the same time, there is this distortion between one causing the other and vice versa the other way around? It depends on the way that these variables are operating. If there's a confounding at play, it's likely they're very quick moving. As one changes, it affects the other, which affects the other. If there's this sort of scenario at play, you've likely got slow moving, lagged exposure. So let's imagine this is waist, waist circumference. This takes a long time to accumulate. It also takes a long time to pass on its information and its risk to insulin concentration over time. So there's going to be some that you'd see immediately and some you'd see passed on later. Well, what do you do there? You would not adjust for Y0. You would just say, if I change this, what would it do to that? You don't need to worry about that. It's part of the process. So looking at change scores gives us the wrong estimate. We look at that simple confounding scenario and we think, what are we interested in? We are interested in the structural part of the follow-up, not determined by the baseline. That is change. If it was determined by the baseline, it's not change. It's already happened. So it's the structural part yet to happen. Well, that's a fairly simple scenario because we want that. We don't want that bit. So how would we estimate this? it would be y1 conditional on y0. What is the part of this that's not caused by that? That is absolutely not the same as y1 minus y0. And that is going to retain spurious information from this minus y0. And that is very important. And we can imagine the problems that this creates if we go to a really, really simple example where there is no change, where there is a deterministic process at play. In other words, we have some variable and it's already determined what it will be like in future in time. It just passes on that information. So we could say, and essentially we just have a scale change. Y0 just causes Y1. There's no change because as soon as that's been set, other than the randomness, y1 has been set. y0 completely determines y1, so we can't modify y1 after y0. There's no change process here. But if that relationship is nonlinear, 
then we would see something from a change score. We would see some variation. And the way to think about that is imagine something like radioactive decay. This is a physically determined process. We can look at a lump of uranium. Bear in mind the information we know. We can count how many radioactive particles there are in there. And we know what it will be like on average. An unbiased estimate, we can produce a, exactly how many there will be in another year's time. But this is a non-linear process. If we calculated a change score, we would see change. And we would see that apparently the change was greater, the decline was greater, the higher this value. Because the higher this value, the bigger the minus y0 would be. And we'd see, it, you know, how many times have you heard, yes, baseline is determining change. People with a higher baseline have a larger change. Then in this scenario, there is no change. And the nature of the disagreement between what you actually want and what you get when you have done this naive analysis of a change score is then going to determine the size and the extent of inferential bias that you may face. Okay, so that's ultimately going to come down to the relationship between your baseline exposure and your baseline outcome. So when that's trivial, such as in your randomized control trial situation, the association between x0 and the change will converge on the association between x0 and follow-up because, in a sense, this bit's irrelevant. It's not doing anything. And because we've done so much of our research in the context of trials, this is where we have stopped. Now, oh, actually, it seems to give the same answer, just with less precision. And now we think, well, as the association between the exposure and the baseline outcome strengthens, then the association between the baseline outcome and this change score will be increasingly dominated by that spurious minus y0. To the extent where if the baseline exposure and the baseline outcome have a strong association, and that dominated over a smaller association with the follow-up outcome, guess what's going to happen? You could end up with a coefficient pointing in the opposite direction to the true thing you're interested in. Let's demonstrate that with a simulation. So we simulated multivariate normal data using um, the Duggerty R package, um, and we imagine these variables just because they're a fairly typical waist circumference of baseline and insulin concentration of baseline and follow-up. We got the data, uh, we informed the simulations from data from the uh, US National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. We looked in there to find out what all the various typical correlations were between these variables, typical mean standard deviations, etc., etc., in order to inform the simulations. We already know what it's going to show, <laughs> but this is just to demonstrate. Because then what we do is we say, well, let's have a look at the coefficient uh, that we would get from the appropriate estimator, the true beta 1, and the change score. I'll call it delta, because it sounds a bit like change, delta 1. So beta 1 is what we want. Delta 1 is what we might get if we naively did a change score analysis. And here's the key message. We fixed the simulation so that the total causal effect of your baseline waist circumference on your follow-up insulin concentration should have always been 0.2, doesn't matter what the units are, okay? When it's not 0.2, you're getting a confusing estimate. Well, what does it look like? In the competing exposure scenario, we would know what to do here. It doesn't really matter whether we adjusted or not for the baseline insulin. We would get, um, with the appropriate estimator, 0.2. We know what we do, we do follow-up put in waist circumference, we could put that in, it doesn't matter. Either way, you'd get 0.2. If you did your change score analysis, you'd also get 0.2, because that spurious negative y0, negative ic0, isn't doing anything. What about when it's a confounder? It's a confounder, we know how to get the correct estimate. We simply adjust for the baseline outcome. 
if we did the naive analysis of change, something's gone wrong. Quite wrong. It's only half in this simulation. Maybe not the end of the world. Not ideal, though. What about the mediation scenario, which I think is probably most likely in this particular setup? Wait circumference, as I've said, is a long, um, lagged exposure with lots and lots of information that's likely to take a long time to pass that on to the rest of your biology. Okay? So it's very like, particularly when you have fast moving things like insulin concentration, it's likely to take time, it's likely to operate both through what you measure today and what you measure in the future. We know in this situation we would ignore this. It's part of the causal process. We'd simply ask, estimate that. What's the beta coefficient for waist circumference? Predicting whatever the appropriate term with insulin concentration as your outcome. What about when we do the change score? Points in the opposite direction. Not a trivial problem. Okay, because one of the things I often get told, as I'm increasingly doing more and more methodological research, is, oh, you know, there's all lots of different methods we can use, and they all give more or less the same answers, and you're just tinkering around the edges. And I say, well, it depends whether you see sign reversal as tinkering around the edges. <laughs> and then I say, and they say, oh, well, that's going to be a complex example. I say, oh, no, it's just the analysis of change. So what's the message? Change scores... <coughs> They don't provide a meaningful effect estimate in observational data. They conflate, instead, information from multiple causal pathways that are influencing the parent variable, both the baseline outcome and the follow-up outcome. Okay, so the implication of that is that whilst your analysis may be statistically unbiased, and that's often maybe why we've missed this, it will give you something very misleading nonetheless. So there's still risk of inferential bias when you look at that, uh, that, uh, that number and you misinterpret it as something else. And the extent of disagreement is not, is not small. Okay? Depending on the size of the relationship between the baseline exposure and the baseline outcome, we could end up with an opposite sign situation. Um, and so what we would recommend is that no future observational study should conduct an analysis of change scores. And indeed, that existing studies which have done this should be viewed with extreme caution. So when I start looking back through some of the health literature and some of the things that inform some of the policies that we make, and I realize how many of them are contaminated by this, I start to think, what on earth is the size of the problem? And thankfully, also, we have the benefit, as a PS, that we've explained Lord's Paradox. The answer is, neither statistician was correct. <laughs> because actually, in, uh, one of them was a lot more correct than the other. But in Lord's scenario, really, we just want to know what the effect of sex is on the weight at the end of the year. Total causal effect. Statistician, one who looked at change scores, produced something utterly meaningless. We can throw that one in the bin straight away. Statistician, two produce the direct causal effect of sex on follow-up. That may have been of interest. In general, I think it's less interesting than total causal effect, but it is meaningful, at least, as long as we recognize that's what it is. But neither said, hang on, what do we really want here? And I think that's where the language of causal inference really helps, first, us to double-check what is it we want, and secondly, to make sure we're then estimating that appropriately. Um, so, like Kellen, I have all of my collaborators to thank, um, most of them of which are in this room. And I also have my students to thank, because I have been struggling with this scenario for three years. And it is only thanks to my students that A, I understand it, and B, I have any hope of explaining it to anyone else. Thank you very much. of this session. Uh, I'd like to introduce Johannes Texter, who is a computational immunologist from um, Radboud University in the Netherlands. Thank you for um, 
this invitation. Can you all hear me? I'm not sure how hard this microphone is. Yes? Probably we can also crank it up. <laughs> because my voice is fading and it will only get worse. So, um, yeah, thanks to, for coming here. So let me start on a personal uh, note because um, the first thing I heard today when I got into the taxi was a big radio interview about Brexit and I think this is a big <laughs> topic. And it kind of felt a bit depressing listening to this stuff for half an hour. Um, so I really, so I have been coming here for quite some time already. So as you know, we have been collaborating for some years. And I just think, um, so one of the things that we should not forget, because we often complain about academia and how broken everything is and how bad this stuff is, but the yeah, was is still very privileged because we can actually form connections between different nations. And this is something for me that is actually very important. So just coming here, for instance, in a time like this where things are falling apart and then still maintaining these kind of connections. This is something that I think we are all very really privileged that we can do this. And um, yeah, I think that's why also why I want to thank you again for inviting me here. Um, but I was going to talk about uh, DAX, causal influence. And um, this has been excellently introduced already, so thank you for that. Um, but before I start, I want to acknowledge a bunch of people. A lot of them are here. Uh, some of them are still here, but maybe uh, leaving. And, um, Others um, are not here, so let me thank my collaborators from uh, Switzerland, from Zurich, with whom I worked quite a lot in the past three years. And uh, I started working in causal influence when I was still a PhD student in Germany, and these are people I've still been working with over the years, and they've contributed to a lot of what you're going to see here. And I get funded by the Dutch Cancer Research Foundation. So, um, why should you care about cause influence? I hope by now you are all super convinced that tags are super important. But my own two slide introduction to this, um, I still want to also um, mention because it is uh, it kind of connects to what Kevin has been doing this morning: um, machine learning and healthcare. Um, so one of the things that I have been seeing uh, in the past. I don't know, 10, 11 years since I work in, actually I did my PhD in machine learning 10 years ago when it was not cool yet, so it was still some field that was kind of a bit more um, unknown, but what you saw regularly was that somebody would come with a new technique and promise that it will cure cancer. <laughs> I've seen that I think five or six times, and sometimes the same companies over and over again. So, and do you remember, so this was in 2011, that was also before the current machine learning, learning hype and deep learning hype and so on. You had IBM Watson, so who knows IBM Watson? This is really a milestone of machine learning, or actually AI, because this supercomputer Watson had a very, a very advanced speech recognition system, and it could use that to be beat the world champion in Jeopardy. So Jeopardy was this is a game that is played using natural language, so it was a real challenge for machine learning systems to, to build a system that is capable of, um, of beating a human in jeopardy where questions are actually asked in a natural language. And that happened already in 2010, 2011, I don't remember exactly, but it's quite a few years ago, before deep learning. Um, so the next thing that happened, obviously, was that IBM promised that Watson would cure cancer. So that would be the next thing. Because now the first thing that we do is beat the human world champion Jeopardy, so obviously now we can cure <laughs> cancer. And that might sound familiar, because what are the big achievements of deep learning? They've solved um, Atari games, 2600. They beat the gold, Go world champion, and they, uh, they built a program that can learn to play chess in four hours by playing against itself. So obviously the next thing you want to do is cure cancer again, right? <laughs> because you've managed to build another system that can beat humans in another game, so this system is going to cure cancer. So if you follow this for many years, there are these recurrent events happening. There's another breakthrough made, and obviously people are excited. So the first thing they want to do is apply it to curing cancer. So Watson, uh, so IBM actually started to, uh, these collaborations with um, several hospitals in the United States. Um, and the idea was basically that you would have let Watson read all of the medical literature and give it all the data, and then it would <laughs> replace the doctors. So what was not as less well publicized maybe was that these projects failed spectacularly. One of these um, was maybe just quietly stopped. It was mentioned on some websites, but not very prominently. 
another one actually, Watson ended up recommending really unsafe and incorrect cancer treatments. So that was not a big success. And it has been, yeah, these projects were running for maybe four or five years, but now they are kind of shelved. Um, and yes, what you see now is that people are promising that deep learning is going to bring the next um, big revolution in healthcare. I would be surprised if that happens. Um, I'm hope, I mean, it would be nice if it happens, let's also say that, right? But I would be surprised. And the reason I would be surprised is that, yeah, as also uh, the previous two talks already said, there are very simple things that we can't even figure out if you just look at data. So this idea that now you have a machine that can see more complicated things doesn't solve the issue that already simple things can pose questions that you just cannot answer just from data. And maybe the best known example of that is again the Simpsons paradox, um, where, you, where you have two possible answers for your question in your data set, and you have to decide between which is the correct answer. So here you ask, are religious people more right-wing or not? And you want to answer this question based on the election data from Germany. So each of these circles is one of the German um, constituencies. Um, if you look at the nationwide trend in the latest uh, general election, then you see that the constituencies that are less religious tend to vote more right-wing. And that sounds like an interesting finding because it's actually opposite to the situation in many other countries like the US where you see the opposite trends where it's the more religious uh, places where you get the higher vote of Republicans. But um, in Germany it's quite particular because we have two different parts of the country and they have been apart for a long time so you have to condition a lot of times. If you do that, then you see that both in East and Western Germany, the trend is the opposite. So you have um, the same, actually the same trend as in the US and many other countries, that people who are more religious tend to vote in higher numbers there, actually on this end of the graph, for uh, right-wing parties. So now you have one data set, three variables, it's not big data, 200 something points, but there are two different answers to your question in this data. You can either say yes or no based on this. So what do you do? And yeah, so what, what would be what would you say? What is the correct answer? And the question. My question is on the top. Are religious people more right wing? Depends on what, sir? What do you include the subgroups? Overall then you have a different answer depending on whether you overall So okay, so your answer would be it depends. <laughs> is there anyone who wants to answer yes or no? Or maybe you could also say I don't, I don't know the answer based on this data. Um, maybe that's true. From, I would say from this data, I would dare to say that um, we see the same thing in Germany than in the US. But that's based on what I know about the history of Germany. And we can come back to that later, but let's now translate this example to something more healthcare related. So we can do the same thing. This is actually an example by Julia Pearl. Uh, suppose we have a treatment and we give that treatment to a bunch of people and then we see the people who we give the treatment to are cured with a certain probability, 0.5, whereas the people who are not treated are only cured in 40%. So it seems to be that the treatment is working. It's not an impressive effect size, but on the same order of many things that we develop in actual cancer care. And we are quite happy if you can reduce the death rate by 10%. Now this seems to be looking good, but now if you split up the data in men and women, then suddenly you see the opposite pattern in both of these subgroups. So you see that both in men and in women, the treatment seems to be doing something bad and is actually detrimental and not beneficial. So my question again, and this is maybe closer to the Watson situation, would be, does now Watson recommend to give this treatment or not, okay? And this is nothing, we don't need machine learning for this to understand this data, but it is a question that is not very easy to answer. Um, so a lot of people would say in the situation, yes, we should not give the treatment because this here is data where we included more information into our analysis and the more the better, right? But we now see from Kellen's talk that this is not the case. You can include a covariance and that could bias your causal effect estimate or not, depending on what the structure is. So basically there's no way to answer this question 
without knowing the causal structure here. And now, to make it even more complicated, suppose that we have something else where we have exactly the same numbers, but now we don't, the thing that we condition on is not gender, uh, in the sense that it's determined at birth, but blood pressure that we measure, measure after treatment. So now we have a data set that contains exactly the same numbers, and my question is, should now the answer to my question be the same or the different answer? So again, a lot of people might intuitively, intuitively think that it should be the same answer because the numbers are the same. But using very simple causal inference techniques, you can show that that's not the case. Because let's look at the first example. If we have gender in a um, determined at birth sense, then it can affect, uh, the, it actually does in the state of set affect the chance that you are treated. It's a non-randomized trial, basically. It can also affect your disease severity, but the reverse is not very plausible. So it's not plausible to assume that your treatment changes your gender. It's also not plausible to assume that cured, being cured changes your gender. So you could, you can remove those errors from your decks quite safely. It's also safe to assume that the cure doesn't affect the treatment because it happens after the treatment. So you can actually quite easily construct a DAG for the situation and you see here that gender is a confounder. So in that case, if you condition on it, it should give you actually a better answer than if you don't condition on it because if you don't, then you fail to address the confounding. In the second situation, blood pressure is something that you measure after treatment, so it could be a mediator of your effect. And if you condition on it, you might block a part of the causal pathway. And that means you're not actually estimating anymore the actual effect of the treatment. So even in a, in a situation where you have only three variables, all of them binary, 100 data points, there are questions that you cannot answer by just looking at the data. So that's a very simple realization. It is possible that the answer is not in the data. And that's something that we all have to actually accept before we start promising things like Watson. Because Watson is built on the premise that the answer is already out there. That we know everything that there is to know about the mechanisms of cancer in order to be able to make the next best treatment. But that is not really in, in cancer. I feel confident to say that we don't know enough about the mechanism yet to even attempt this. So, um, and that's the same reason why I'm a bit skeptical about deep learning. I love deep learning, it's a great technique, but I'm not convinced that we have enough mechanistic information to even make this possible yet. Okay, so this is why I believe we should be doing causal inference if you want to answer this kind of questions. But now um, let's uh, break this a bit more down. So we've heard a bit about DAX already. Uh, and how we can use DAGs, and I think it makes sense to distinguish between different things that you can do with DAGs. So I am not very happy yet with this categorization, so if you have any feedback on that, I would be very interested, but I think I can distinguish at least three different ways in which you can use a DAG. The first way would be, in a theoretical sense, that you use DAGs in order to develop cause and inference methodology itself, which is kind of what Peter has been doing. You use it as a tool in order to reason about an analysis pattern and then you come up with a general uh, conclusion like for instance don't use change scores but for the user to then follow that conclusion they don't necessarily need to understand everything that we've done. It's probably better if they do but as long as you're right it's also maybe not uh, totally necessary. So that, what I, and this has been a very successful application of DAX actually. So DAX have really catalyzed the development of cause and inference methodology. Um, and then you can apply them in practice. And I want to distinguish between two different ways. Um, one which I call positively practical and another one which I call negatively. I'm not really happy with these two words because I don't think this in, in negative in the sense of bad. It's negative in the sense that you draw a deck to show to somebody that they're doing something wrong. You should draw a deck to show, look, this could be a collider, or look, this could be a confounder. Look, you're conditioning on this, so you're generating selection bias. So you're using a deck in order to question or maybe even invalidate some other analysis, which I think is something that epidemiologists <coughs> that I know all enjoy a lot, so they all enjoy telling each other. <laughs> Um, that they are all wrong and our analysis are false. So maybe that's one reason why DAGs are so popular in epidemiology. 
but it's also it's also undoubtedly successful. So DEX have shown a lot of problems, like for example, collider bias is something that's very hard to really develop an intuition if you don't have DEX. So if you a lot of people will claim DEX have not been successful. That is not true. In, in these two areas, they have been very successful. But now let's talk about the positively practical is, of course, what we want to do. We want to draw a DAG for some specific data set that we have, some specific question that we want to answer. And then we want to use the DAG in order to do causal inference. And I was surprised, I think Kevin, you said that this is obviously what we want, but we can also use the DAG. Oh, no, that's what you said that, right? Um, you can also use the DAG to think about it. I would actually say the opposite. I've seen a lot of good applications of DAGs in this way, but I would be hard pressed to find a single good example of this. It's theoretically possible if you have a DAG to do all kinds of nice stuff, but I have never seen a single example in, uh, of a good DAG in epidemiology. And that is actually no surprise because I believe that doing this this year is a thousand times harder than doing one of these two things. And I've done this myself, it's also hard, but it's also, once you're done, you're done. You have, a, you have a new method, right? And the method has certain properties. But this is something that is much harder to do. And um, I just now want to show you a bit about my own research, because I'm not an epidemiologist. We do actually computational tumor immunology um, in our group. This is um, the people that I work with. And what we do is um, we work on cancer, so we try to indeed develop new cancer treatments. And for this we analyze data, and data can have different forms. This is for instance an image of immune cells uh, that are infiltrating in some tissue. Okay, so there are T cells here, B cells and other cells. So what we try to do is we try to understand how the presence of these cells uh, shapes the tumor microenvironment and how we can use that knowledge to develop new therapies. Um, and to do that, we need to use things like uh, machine learning. So here, for example, we use deep learning in order to segment these cells. So if you ask the question, is deep learning useful for healthcare, I would say, hey, yes. Before deep learning, I would <laughs> need right, I would, I've tried it myself and I would need, we've worked for years yeah. on the segmentation stuff and we failed to get it working. And when we tried deep learning, we had it working within one week. Okay, so that is, it is amazing. This technology is amazing. Once, if you've ever done yourself image analysis, you understand why people are so excited about it because it is amazing. The, the hype is justified in, in, that, in that application area. It's really, it's a, it's a quantum leap, and I'm not using that word lightly. It's really a big step ahead. But then the next thing that we want to do is we want to use that information somehow. In our case, that means taking that information and putting it into a model. We use that model to predict what the consequence of the cell pattern distribution would be. Now things start getting more complicated because now we have to know how these cells behave. So we need to know something about the cells, make assumptions that we put into a model. In this case, our model is a simulation model. But in order for the simulation model to be useful in any way, we need to be confident that we're putting the right mechanisms in there. So how do we do that? We go through cycles and cycles and cycles of falsification and tweaking the model. We've been doing it in this case for more than, well, we in the sense of the community have been building this type of models for more than 30 years. There are, I think, hundreds of papers based on this model again and again tested against different types of experimental data, refined and refined, until we have a model that we can really, um, I mean, we still don't completely trust it. We know that there are still things that are not correct about it, but we have a fairly good feeling that this model generates behavior that we can actually reproduce in the experiment, and we've seen it and done it multiple times. That's what makes us confident that we can use this model. I'm just showing that to illustrate that um, what I use, what I call the positively practical use, is not a one-off thing where you draw one bag and you're done, but instead it should be um, something like a cycle, right? So it should be following this general methodology that you see in any modeling uh, community, as if it's physics or biology or something else. You have to go through these cycles. You build, you make your hypotheses, 
we formalize them in some way, and that can be a simulation model, it can be a differential equation model, an agent-based model, or a DAG. A DAG is a model in the end. Then you, but then what you then should do is you should make predictions from your model and test them. And in most cases, you will be wrong. I've never seen somebody build a correct model in the first, in, certainly not the first time, but even after multiple rounds, we are still never completely certain that our model is correct. So what do we have to do? We have to falsify ourselves. So we, the only thing that we can do is we can generate predictions. And then these predictions turn out to be wrong in many cases. If they don't turn out to be wrong, then it doesn't still mean that you are now finished, but it could just be that there's something else that you can predict that turns out to be wrong. And some other experiment that you could do that would have falsified your model. So this is the, I think this is the requirement for really usage of DAGs in this positive sense. And I'm not seeing that done now in epidemiology at all. In most cases, you have one paper, one DAG in it, if you're lucky, and in many cases they don't even show it. But I've certainly never seen somebody take a DAG and improve it and, and, and go through at least one iteration of the cycle. So, um, yeah, this is a summary of what I just said. I think the reason that we're seeing so little good examples of DAGs being used is not because they suck, but it is because it's super hard, and it's much harder than just showing one DAG that tells you, yeah, you're wrong. That's simple. You show one DAG, and it's a DAG says you could be wrong. Of course, that's simple. But this will take much more effort. So what do we have to do to get to a point where we could have positive uh, usage of DAGs, we have to go through these cycles. Um, as far as I can see it, well, and that's, that's um, still a very important point, it's also depressi a depressing activity because you can never prove your model correct in a sense. The only thing that you can do is fail to prove yourself wrong. But it doesn't mean that you're right. It could also just mean that you haven't tried hard enough to falsify yourself. And that's the proper philosophy of science. But also, I mean, many people say this is depressing, right? If I explain this to a the neurologist, they say, yeah, why? But, but what am I going to do if I see I'm wrong? Should I then change my model or what? Yeah, of course you should change. Um, and then they say, no, I don't want to do that. But the thing is that also, according to a fairly standard philosophy of science, this is what science means. It means to falsify yourself. And if you don't falsify yourself, then you would so pseudo I probably would even say this is the difference between science and pseudoscience. Science means falsification. If you cannot falsify yourself, you're not doing science. So what I want to do in the rest of the time is I want to show how you can prove yourself wrong. How you can try to, to disprove the model that you've built. Because that will be the next step in the cycle. And I'm not sure if this will ever be done. I have no idea. Maybe at some point epidemiologists are going to decide this is too hard. I don't want to do that. So let's just not use DAX. It's possible that it's all doom and doom randomization because that's much better. But um, at least if it's going to be done, it has to be done. I don't see any other way of getting to the point where you can actually use a DAG in a positive sense. Okay, and, there, and the good news is there are thousands of ways to prove yourself wrong. And I'm just going to touch about a few of those. Um, but it's actually a very interesting topic, and there's still research being done actively trying to find more ways in which you can prove yourself wrong. So if you have a bit of a um, masochistic tendency, then this is a very good field to be in, because you're going to read new papers all the time about how you can disprove yourself. So we've already seen something that works. If you have a DAG that has no latent values in it, and you can use conditional independence. And let's look a bit about that. Uh, Kellen already explained uh, the only thing that I need for that, which is deseparation. You didn't mention this name, but you did mention that we have different types of uh, paths in the DAGs and that they imply different dependency patterns. So we don't, I don't have to repeat that. We call that deseparation, but deseparation is a graphical criterion. And it is important because it, uh, there's this theorem that tells me if I have a DAG and I can deseparate two variables by some other variables, then that means that these two variables must be conditionally independent given these others in all probability distributions that could possibly have been generated. 
by the stack. So from a philosophical perspective, this separation gives me statements that I can use to disprove myself. Because the deck will say this should be independent, I can go on and test that. And if it isn't independent, then that means that my DAG must be wrong. It cannot possibly have generated my data. Okay, so let's see how that works. I am now showing a few really kind of applied uh, examples, and I'm showing R code here. I hope that you don't mind. I think it's readable for the most part. So let's assume that we've built this DAG here. It's very simple, a collider structure. And that was your example with being attractive and wealthy and so on. So let's see, let's see if that DAG is actually correct. Then we would need to gather data on wealth and attractiveness levels and so on. And this DAG, um, yeah, um, we can also uh, test that by simulating data, but we could also apply this to real data. So let's suppose that we have this DAG, and then we have a data set like this. I assumed here that we have just discrete variables. So every variable can be minus one or plus one. So in this case, because I simulated my data from my own model, it should be not in contradiction with my own model. Okay? So this is my data set, and I now want to go and test my DAG against this data set. And that's very simple, because there's one thing I can test only. Um, there's one path in this DAG from X to Y, which is a collider. We call that deseparated, and that means that it implies that x and y should be independent from each other. That's what the collider model says. And, well, this is a statement, and how you test that statement now depends on your data. So, for example, if you have categorical data, then you could just use a chi-square test that tests in, uh, independence. So let's do that. We have these data that we generated. We run a chi-square test. Our chi-square test gives us a chi-square of 0.6. The expected chi-square under the null hypothesis is 1. The p-value is 0.43. So that means that we haven't really found strong evidence against our own model from this data. And now, because it's epidemiology, you don't like a lot of things. You also don't like p-values, or at least many of you don't. One reason that you do not like p-values might be because it's coupled to null hypothesis significance testing, where you actually don't prove you prove what you're interested in by disproving the opposite, which is kind of an awkward logical construction. So let me point out that this is not a null hypothesis test, because the hypothesis I'm testing is not a null hypothesis. It's a prediction that my model makes, and I'm directly testing that prediction. So it's really a different thing from NHST. But still, if you don't like p-values, then by all means look at the effect size, like the chi -square, actual chi-square value. So for this, it should be 1, and it's less than 1, so that seems OK. So this is good news. We've, uh, we have a model, we have data, and we failed to prove ourselves wrong. OK, now let's see how this would work um, when we have a wrong model. So let's assume that we now make a FOB model, uh, that this is a true model, and we've postulated a collider model. So we've been wrong. This fourth model here predicts that x and y should be dependent because they have a common cause, but our collider model that we postulate says that they should be independent. In a situation like this, um, and now I switch to continuous data to show how it would work in that case, let's assume that we have um, two variables x and y, and we, they are both continuous. Then we can show, uh, we can, for instance, evaluate the correlation between them. Um, and the correlation, I'm getting confused here by what I see. Oh, I'm sorry, this is, this is wrong. <laughs> it should be different. Um, because what you should see here is that they are actually dependent, but they're not dependent. So it looks like a reduced wrong data in this example. I'm sorry for that. Anyway, um, uh, I hope that you can forgive this mistake and then say, um, what, I want to sh what I wanted to show was just that there are basically two different strategies that you can use to test conditional independence. One of them is regression, where you use the regression model, and another one is stratification. So now um, the fork model that we just were hoping to test has an implication, it's actually conditional independence implication. 
And uh, this says that x and y should be independent conditioned on z. Okay? And um, statistical procedures for testing conditional independence fall in one of these. So it becomes now more complicated because before we just had to look at the relationships between two variables. Um, and now we have other variables involved. This could be one variable, but it could also be several others. So things become more complicated. And we have to do something more, a bit more fancy. But in general, we can use always, almost always, one of these two strategies, either regression or stratification. Yeah, this looks much better. I'm sorry. <laughs> so here, yeah, we have one says testing the, the, the model here. So what I wanted to see was indeed this co positive correlation between X and Y, whereas my deck, um, the collider deck, would have predicted that I should not. So this is good, because now otherwise it will get very confusing. Um, <clears throat> so let's see what this first strategy would be. So we have this fork model, and now we test the actual fork model. So it again should be correct. This fork model implies that x and y are conditionally independent given z. So that means what I can do to test that is I can construct two regression models, and I will do it like this, and in other software maybe differently, and I form the residuals of these models. So I basically take the difference between the regression line and the actual data. I do this for two different models, and now I plot the residuals against each other. And now for the residuals, I again perform a standard dependence test. So that means we can reduce conditional independence to normal independence by using regression. We make regression models, we form residuals, and then we look at the residuals <coughs> instead of the normal values. Okay? It's something that you can also do in any standard statistical software, so it's not very really fancy. And this would also work if the Z are, for example, categorical or binary, because you can still put them into a regression model using dummy coding, for example. So, um, <laughs> I'm saying here that this finds no evidence against the model because the correlation here is quite low, it's 0.04. I didn't put a p-value in this case, but if you want, you can use p-values or confidence intervals or Bayesian statistics or anything that you want. Uh, the idea is that this should be uncorrelated and you have to test somehow if that is true. Um, now a bit more difficult is the second strat uh, strategy, which is stratification. Stratification means that you can, instead of using regression, you just uh, bin the values of z, and you perform different tests in the different strata of z, and then you combine these results somehow. Um, so for example, if all your data happens to be discrete or binary, I just made binary data here, then you could do different chi-square tests for the different levels of the thing that you're conditioning on. So for example, here you, you have z, which can be 0 or 1, so you do, you do two different chi-square tests instead of one chi-square test. And if your z had 10 different values, then you would have to do 10 different chi-square tests. So now for each chi-square test, you get a result. In this case, none of these chi-square tests uh, really does provide strong evidence against the model, which is because you simulated from the correct model in the first place. So this is the second strategy. As you can see, it's a bit it's a bit, it has advantages and disadvantages compared to the regression model. It doesn't uh, rely on linearity assumptions, for example. It is non-parametric. But the disadvantage is that you have to stratify your data. And it can be very messy if you have a lot of things here, a lot of possible values. And you might have very small sub data sets that you're testing things on, and that can become quite difficult. So it is a bit of a choice. Um, and that depends really on the data that you have on the situation that you are in, if you have a lot of data or little data. So that is not something that should be uh, automated, for example. Now, um, for the chi-square test specifically, we can actually use a fairly nice property of the chi-square test to solve this problem. Because if you have chi-square variables, two different ones, so these might be the two different test results, then we know that the sum of two chi-square variables is another chi-square variable. So they are closed under addition, just like the normal variables also. And uh, specifically, if you add one chi-square with a degrees of freedom to another chi-square with d degrees of freedom, then you get the sum that has a plus b degrees of freedom. So that means if you have two different chi-square tests, you can basically just add up the statistics and you add up the degrees of freedom and in that way you combine them to one chi-square test. 
and that gives you one single effect size and one single p-value, which is, I think, more desirable than if you have 100 different p-values that you have to combine somehow. Because that's a very difficult problem in itself. It's known as the as the multiple testing problem, and you really want to avoid that if you don't have to deal with it. So again, the conclusion is the same in this case. We don't find strong evidence against the model. OK, now let's look at a more maybe realistic example. Actually, I will skip this and go straight to an even more realistic example, <laughs> which um, is this. So this is something I've been doing with my students in uh, Nijmegen for a couple of years. Um, we've been building DAGs for data sets that are just out there. And one data set that is very popular to the point that even at some point said I don't want to see it anymore mm -hmm. is the so-called adult income data set. It's a data set that also um, is very popular on the Kaggle machine learning platform. It's a data set that um, is based on a census in the US and it measures the income of people and it also reports various uh, demographic characteristics. It's based on a real census, so it is supposed to be an unbiased and fairly large data set. And the idea here is that you want to study the determinants of, um, of your income. So for example, you might use this data set to see if there is an actual gender pay gap. Yeah? Because what you want is actually a situation here that your um, sex, uh, your gender at birth in that sense, your biological sense, determines your income, if at all, only indirectly through other factors, but not directly once you take other factors into account. And you maybe even don't want this to be the case, right? That education is different for men and women is bad, if it's the case. But gender pay gap, I mean, the classical argument of many people from a certain political background would be that gender pay gap doesn't exist because you can explain it all away by conditioning on experience and education and so on. So this hypothesis would be encoded in a DAG like this, which is fairly optimistic. It says that there's no discrimination against gender and race anymore once you condition on uh, marital status, hours per week, and your education level. So that would represent a fairly positive, optimistic political theory. So now we use the same approach that I just showed you to test this model on the data set. So, um, and then we can use this method we can derive hundreds of tests that we can run actually for this day. It has a lot of implications. And depressingly, if we do that, then we find the result like this. <coughs> Every single test is false. And this is actually what you will always, I mean, I've done this hundreds of times with many different students now. I've never seen a single model that, fa that passed this test. And actually working in modeling for many years it also doesn't surprise me a lot because I've also never built a model that was actually correct in the first, uh, in the first instance. But these are the numbers and you can try it for yourself. Um, you will probably also not be able to come up with a deck that actually holds true once you try to falsify it. But then there's another problem because we have these p-values and now we come to another point why I don't like p-values is that they depend on your sample size. And this is a fairly, fairly large sample. So the fact that I get these enormously low p-values here doesn't mean that this is actually an important problem. It could be that this is a very small deviation from independence, but it gives me just a low p-value because right, we've all seen this medical papers. Uh, my drug improves uh, uh, overall survival. P is 0.0 or whatever. It could be, but it could also be because you just looked at 50,000 patients and indeed it improved the survival by one day, but the p-value was low anyway. So we don't want that. We also want to have some idea about how severe these problems are. So because this is most of this is categorical data, again, it becomes a bit hard. So we need some kind of effect size measure. For the chi-square, we have actually several different measures. The possible one that I like is the so-called root mean square error of approximation. And what you do here is you take your chi-square, you divide it by the degrees of freedom. This should give you a value of 1 under the null hypothesis. And then you divide it by the square root of the number of samples minus 1. So this number here is asymptotically independent of the sample size. So it kind of normalizes away the sample size effect. And what you now get is a number that if the <coughs> independence hypothesis is true, then it's 0. And otherwise, it will converge to some non-zero number as you increase your sample size. So it will not have this dependence on sample size. 
And obviously, the higher the root mean square error is, the worse the model fits. It behaves a bit like a correlation coefficient in that sense, so it is bounded by zero and, and one, but it doesn't reach one very often. So if you do that, we get a bit of a more clear picture. So one thing that we see is that we're actually right here, and this one thing that we can't claim is actually true. Being an immigrant is not dependent on your gender. Yeah, I put no error there because I didn't expect there to be uh, any uh, link, and indeed this holds true. There's really a non-measurable dependence. All of the others are wrong. So now get, let me give you a bit of an idea about this RMCA scale. So what people often use as yeah, cutoffs, even though they're arbitrary, but the 0.02 RMCA is a bit similar to a correlation of 0.08 or 0.09 or something. So it's certainly not a very strong dependence. But what we can now do is we can just look at these problems and we can focus on what is actually the biggest problem. By far the biggest problem here is that this data set contains a relationship between marital status and sex. Okay. And now we should, we should stop for a minute because what have I not done? I built a model and this model was wrong. So you could say I have not learned anything. In this case, we've actually learned quite a lot by doing this. Because why did I not draw an arrow between marital status and sex? Because I believe that this is a data set from the 1980s in the United States. Every marriage is one man, one woman. So you cannot possibly have more married men than married women in the United States. It's just not possible by definition. Yeah. Now with same-sex marriage it becomes a bit more complicated, but even then this is a small part of the population, so you wouldn't expect a very strong correlation there. But if you look at the actual data, you're 10 times more likely to be married in, in this data set if you're male than if you're female. Okay? So what has now happened? I disproved not the DAG, but the data set. So I found, <laughs> I found that this data set is total rubbish, really. It is, it is not, it is claimed to be a census data set. It even have, has weights on each person to make it representative. But it's clear that this data set is very far from representative. <laughs> and this data set has been used in 150 or more papers in order to study the determinants of income. And no one ever saw this until my students did this. <laughs> and this is, I think, a severe issue. That, that just ha has never been seen because people just use the data thinking that this will be okay because it's a census data set, but maybe something went wrong in pre-processing or whatever. I have no idea how this happened. But I can tell you that there has a Kaggle competition was run, a machine learning competition using this data set in order to predict the determinants of your income. The best determinant is being male, so of course it generated a lot of headlines. And of course I don't want to discredit the findings per se, but it's also clear that you cannot really say that based on this data set. Mm -hmm. So that, that is a severe issue. So that means in some situations, Actually, I would tell you, in most situations, in modeling factors, you also learn something if you're wrong. It doesn't, it's not always important to be correct. The process itself also generates insight. In this case, the insight that you need to use different data. It's not uh, appropriate. Okay. <coughs> um, yeah, let me spend maybe five more minutes on showing you something that you may not know already, um, which is this. Um, because the conditional independence testing is something that a lot of you are at least a substantial fraction of the audience is familiar with. I also wanted to point out that this is not the only way in which you can test models. There are also other ways and they're still being discovered. And one thing that I find very interesting that I wanted to share is the instrumentality tests. Who has ever heard about instrumentality tests before? Some people. Um, this, is not, this is not my work, right? This is a work by uh, Pearl and Bonnet. It's a very classical result. So um, a problem that we often have is that there are confounders that we cannot measure or that we maybe don't even know exist. So many people instead like to use instrumental variables. For instance, Mendelian randomization is an example of that. You say it's hopeless. You cannot control for confounding anyway, so let's just try to find an instrument instead. Um, the common knowledge is that this instrument uh, requires you to make untested assumptions. That's not quite true because this DAG here implies a conditional independence. These two variables are independent if you condition on X and U. 
But the problem is that you cannot test it because you cannot observe you. But still, um, there's something that remains, and that's what I want to show. I'm using this example. It's a classic IV model, the Vietnam War Lottery. It's one of the first and nicest IV, IVs. Um, in the United States, they at some point had trouble recruiting more young men for the Vietnam War. So they uh, did this thing. They drafted days from the calendar. And then they would just call for the lucky ones if you were born on a September 14th, and you would get a call from the army, if you, and they would ask you if you didn't want to enlist in the, in the army. It wasn't mandatory, it was just really recruitment. So that means that you could see like a um, try with imperfect confines. So if you would be born on a September 14th, you would get a call, but if you were born on June 20th, you would not get a call. And then after getting this call, you might or might not decide to go to the army. And you might also make the same decision if you did not get this call. So now, um, economists have been using this lottery as a sort of natural experiment because it is actually random by definition. So we can use this as an instrument to study the effect of going, uh, enlisting in the army on your later economic, or maybe also health outcomes. Which is otherwise quite difficult because these two things could be confounded by many different factors. So the question is, this is our model, and you make this assumption. The assumption that you're making is that the fact that you get your call per se doesn't mean that your earnings are affected, other than through you actually going to the war. OK, but this still, this DAG is not untestable in the sense that it doesn't, it's not compatible with every data set. An untestable model would be one that can fit every data set that we throw at it. But if you would find the following, that all people who won the lottery all went to Vietnam and now they all earn a lot. At the same time, all those who lost in the lottery also all went to Vietnam and they now earn little. This would be, this would be incompatible with this model. Why? Because you can see here that the lottery has no effect because everyone went to Vietnam anyway, right? But it seems to have an effect on lifetime earnings. So it cannot be generated by a model like this where you have no direct error from one lottery to lifetime earnings. So you could say this is an extreme example, but it's obviously a possible data set. This data set is not compatible with the stack. And now the interesting thing is that it still holds if you replace this everything by probabilities. So for example, if you say 90% of the people won a lottery went to Vietnam, and earn a lot, but also 90% of them who lost also went to Vietnam and earn little, then this is still not compatible with each other because these 90%, um, the effect of the IV is still far too small in order to explain this huge difference that you observe at the end of this chain. So that means that there is something here that can be tested, obviously. There are data sets that are incompatible with this model. And suppose we observe this data set, um, so the actual uh, implication is that this kind of probabilities must sum up to something that is low, below 1. So for example, the probability that y and x are both 1 uh, or that they are different must be uh, sum, sum up to something that is smaller than 1. Um, and that means, for example, that this data set here would also be incompatible with the stack. And that's what we call an instrumentality test. So unlike common knowledge, it is not true that we cannot test instrument assumptions. We can test them. Uh, the reason that this is not done commonly is that it requires x to be discrete. If it's binary, it's possible. If it has more levels also, but if it's continuous, then there are no implications anymore that you can test. It's a very subtle, subtle thing. And there's quite a lot of advanced math involved in this at some point. But um, still, I want you to take away that even this kind of models are testable. Even if you can't use these separation directly, there's often something else that you can do. And it's still only being discovered, and there are still more things. This is an active research topic still. I review papers on this thing every year. And they're still always improving it and finding more ways to test this model. OK. And now I won't have time for my final part anymore, but that's fine. The only thing I wanted to say is that um, you can, if you want to falsify your models in many different ways, 
I would encourage you to do that, even if it seems to be very negative. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what will happen, if anyone is going to do this in the future or not. Um, and I thank you for your attention.